from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. This is uh, David Klein for the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress uh, Civil Rights History Project. Today is March the 1st, 2013, and I'm in San Mateo, California. And uh, today we have the pleasure of speaking with Mildred Pitts Walter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for participating in this project. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you for inviting <laughs> me to participate. So we will, uh, we're going to, I'm on, just for the record, I'm on channel two. Uh, Miss Walter is on channel one. Okay. And we'll just start right into it. Right. Okay. So what I'd like you, um, if we could just start, if you could tell me a little bit about where you were raised and, and your family. I was born in Louisiana mm -hmm. in 1922. And um, my mother and father were together for a while. And um, when Long Bell Lumber Company left Louisiana, my father was working with them in Mississippi, mm. and my mother was still in Louisiana. So I grew up in a place called Doretta, Louisiana, between Lake Charles and uh, Shreveport in southwest Louisiana. I went to uh, hot, finished Beauregard Parish High School, where the only new book I ever had was the history of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. Mm -hmm. All the other books we had had pages torn out or mm -hmm. marked up and mm -hmm. but can you describe the I'd love to hear a description of the school itself and your teachers yeah. or the kind of well, teachers you had. We we were an all black school mm -hmm. and um, the school uh, was finally a pretty nice building. Um, before we had the new school, we were in churches and mm -hmm. places, and finally we had a school with a principal who could do electricity and heat, and mm -hmm. so we got lights and uh, rather than lamps, and um, this was all in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And um, all of our teachers were African American, mm -hmm. or at that time we were Negroes. Mm -hmm. We all were Negroes, and they were really wonderful teachers. Mm -hmm. And they helped us to know that we were not inferior. Mm -hmm. and, and we took seriously Carter G. Woodson's history that told us about Africa and mm -hmm the nice things about Africa. And um, of course we had the church. The church was very important because the ministers and the leaders insisted that we hold our heads high. Mm. And we uh, took learning seriously. And whatever we did, do it with an attitude of excellence mm -hmm. and uh, to walk and approach uh, those who hated us with humility, mm -hmm. for humility could not be humiliated. Mm -hmm. And we learned that and mm -hmm. became uh, really strong. And I made goals and made choices I worked from the time I was seven. Mm. I worked uh, taking care of a little white girl for a while. Mm. And then I worked in a beauty shop, mm -hmm. cleaning the beauty shop. And I worked in homes, cleaning homes. and While also going to school? While going to high school. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And met some very interesting white people who uh, seemed to appreciate the fact that I wanted not to just do that always. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there was one woman who came, uh, Camp Polk was in Leesville, mm -hmm. not far from us. 
and that was time during World War II. And these soldiers were there, and um, their wives came, and one woman came from Ohio, and she uh, hired me to come and help her. She insisted that I sit at the table and eat with her. And I, I just felt, you know, but she was very nice about it. She, we sat and she talked and I was a sophomore in college. Mm. And she gave me magazines to read and insisted she would talk about what we have, had read. Mm -hmm. And when she left, she said to me that I was the only person that she felt comfortable with. Very in that place. Hmm. Wish I could remember her name. Where was she from? She was from somewhere in Ohio. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you later how I learned why the majority of Southerners didn't let us eat together. Mm. <laughs> mm. But she insisted on my doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, I went from there to Southern University in Scotlandville, Louisiana. And I finished Southern. Well, while I was there, of course, I came in contact with very interesting leaders, uh, Mordecai Johnson, W.E.B. Du Bois, mm. and all of them came and talked to us and inspired us. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And when I left there in 1944, I knew that I couldn't, well, before that, in my senior year, I went up into the state of Washington, Longview, Washington, and I worked in the shipyards in Vancouver, uh, Washington. So how did, you end up, how did you end up there doing that kind of my work? My sister had gone there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Her husband had moved there. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, back in the 30s, and she lived in Longview, Washington, okay. and I went there to work in the shipyards to earn enough money to finish, right. finish Southern, right. and uh, I had had a lot of experience in personnel, mm. working with the Dean of Women and stuff, so I applied for a job in personnel at the shipyards, and they laughed at me. Hmm. It was very highly discriminating, mm -hmm. even there, mm -hmm. during that time of the war. So what job did you end up doing I there? I ended up cleaning ships, mm. uh, working in gyro rooms and, and cleaning ships. And the, my uh, manager, my supervisor, uh, fell. She said, this is not the kind of work for you. Mm -hmm. And she tried, but nothing happened. Mm -hmm. You often hear about um, African American <clears throat> women uh, with dur jobs during the war that uh, last hired, first fired. Right. What, what kind of experience did you have? Well, I was. I only wanted to be there for a while, mm. but um, the the women who worked with me, both black and white, they had children, mm. and we were on the graveyard shift. Mm. So I came in well-rested, and, and they would fall asleep. Mm. <laughs> and I would awake them when the supervisor was coming. Mm. And they appreciated that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so you were working alongside uh, white women as well as uh, yeah, black women? Yeah, white women and black women, right. yes. And mm -hmm. how was that? What was that experience like? Well, it was, it was a nice experience. Um, they knew that I was a college student, mm. and um, they, they felt that, you know, I shouldn't be there and should get, go back as soon as I could, and mm. I did. Mm -hmm. I went back and graduated mm. at, at Southern. And when I graduated, with my mother's blessings, I went to L.A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask again about Washington. Was that really your first time outside of the South? That was my first time mm -hmm. out of the South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And did that do anything to you as far as seeing how things were yes. in another part of the country? Yes. Right. Uh, African Americans were segregated in the little town. Mm -hmm. They all lived together. They went to the same church. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but the, uh, they, they were, they could go to an integrated school. Mm -hmm. But they lived in, in a segregated neighborhood. Right. And, but they were very much separated. They didn't, the kids didn't interchange visits mm -hmm. or anything like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. even there mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Did that surprise you or would, did well, it seem expected, do you think, at that well, time I, for you? I, I just expected that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I didn't know, I didn't know uh, what the difference should have been. Well, I felt that it should have been different, mm. but uh, especially working, mm. I thought that I, I would be able to work, uh, do something different than cleaning ships. But I was very lucky that the, they were finished and didn't have all of that um, stuff that caused lung problems. Mm. Mm. Yes, mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky. Because what we did, we prepared the ships for uh, sailing, you know, mm -hmm. the first voyage, right. the first voyage trip. Yeah. We prepared them for that. And of course, uh, we never went on a voyage. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Very interesting. But um, I, I saw the ocean mm. for the first time. We went to the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. and I was awed. I thought, this must be all the water in the world. <laughs> and it was such a nice experience. Mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon was a very beautiful city. Mm -hmm. Lots of roses. It's mm -hmm. the town of roses. And mm -hmm. my brother-in-law would take me to places mm -hmm. to, so that we could uh, see mm -hmm. Mount... Uh, Oh, that mountain that just had the terrible Mount St. Helens, Mount oh, Saint yeah, Helens yeah. was in our back. We could see it from our back door, mm. and it had snow then, mm. snow on on Mount St. Helens all year round. Mm. Mm -hmm. It looks different now. <laughs> I, I bet yeah. after that volcanic yeah. action. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> so, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Work with the machines a little bit. Uh, okay, so uh, you went, you graduated, and you were saying, and then um, decided to move to Los yes. Angeles. <clears throat> I applied for. Well, after having worked in Washington, mm. I knew that I did not have to work for the amount of money that they were paying in uh, Louisiana for teachers, and that was the only. I could have gone to work at Camp Polk as in the laundry or something like that. Uh, but those were the only jobs for college graduates in Louisiana at that time. You were either a teacher or a maintenance person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I applied for a job in Shreveport. They wanted me to teach high school English and do the library for fifty dollars a month. Hmm. And I thought, no. And I decided that and my mother my mother was a very smart woman. And she said when you go to college they wash you down, and you change, hmm. and you don't fit hmm. in the place. And I, I didn't understand what she was saying. Hmm. I didn't understand what she was saying. But she knew that... Um, to, at that time, mm -hmm. they taught us in these places mm -hmm. very differently. Mm -hmm. 
and we felt that um, we spoke correct English mm -hmm. and um, we didn't use the dialect. Mm -hmm. Were there others in your family who had gone to college? Not at that time. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest mm -hmm. and the first. And the first. Mm -hmm. How many siblings do you have? There were seven of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I had five sisters and one brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of that's in that. Okay, great. But um, she gave me her blessing mm -hmm. and uh, was very happy that I wanted to uh, achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now when, I, and when I'm, I'm a mother and uh, as old as I am, I understand what she was saying. Mm -hmm and um, how that can make a difference mm -hmm. with your parents, mm -hmm. especially. She had wanted me to follow in her footsteps being a midwife hmm. and a healer, mm -hmm. and I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a bit bittersweet. Yes. Yeah. She yeah. had uh, wanted to teach me her methods. Hmm. She did a, she had a cure for pneumonia hmm. before penicillin, and it was penicillin, hmm. but we didn't know that. <laughs> it was definitely penicillin. When we would put the pigs on a floor, p feed them grain, pure mash, hmm. they would get in their hooves and mold. Hmm. She would boil that, boil them, yeah. and give them. The doctor would say to people who had them, I can't help you, go see Mary. And she would cure them with that tea. Very interesting. She also used oyster shells, mm. red hot oyster shells in water, cool that for uh, kidney problems. Hmm. And they know now that oyster shells have a special medicine that they use now to cure uh, kidney infection. Hmm. She was very a very smart hmm. woman with very little formal education. How had she learned um, her art? I don't know. Hmm. I really don't know how hmm. she had learned that. Hmm. But her... Her mother, she had a sister who was 10 years old at the end of slavery. Mm. And she was born in 18, in 1890-something. Okay. So uh, she probably knew how to go and find the herbs and mm -hmm. the plants, and she could do that. Mm. She could go and find plants and knew these plants that could serve as a cure for certain things, and especially for women mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so your family saw you off to Los Angeles. Los Angeles, <laughs> <coughs> yes. And I went to Los Angeles. I knew, I went with a, a high school classmate who had a brother who was living and Skid Row. Mm -hmm. And we went and stayed in a hotel on Fifth Street, mm -hmm. <laughs> very iffy place mm -hmm. in Los Angeles mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. But a lot of uh, people were, transits were mm -hmm. there. And I went and stayed there a few days. And then I met a woman on the bus. And I told her I had come, just come to town, and I thought there would be a Y, mm. WCA for mm -hmm. black women. Mm -hmm. There was not a Y, WCA there, mm. and I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So she said, well, give me a, she gave me a phone number. 
No, okay, we so were in Los Angeles. Yeah, and if I could just ask you, I, I forgot to say, ask you what year that was, that when you that first That was went. in 1944. Okay. When I went to Los Angeles. Great. And you were just saying you met a I met woman this, on the bus. Yes. And uh, what happened, I was sitting sort of in the back, and I saw this woman, and she looked very intelligent and very friendly. And I, I had been <clears throat> taught that um, we could trust certain, certain mm. people, and you can tell who you can trust. And um, I went, I got up and went and sat mm -hmm. beside her. And she introduced herself and told me a joke when I told her I had just come. She said, oh, these people are coming in, coming into town, she said. And one day a lady was on the bus and she sat beside um, a person and this woman was just coming from the south. She was eating on the bus. And the lady said to her, we don't eat on the bus. And she asked the woman, how long you been here? And the woman told her she had been there for many years. She said, well, when I've been here long as you, I won't eat on the bus either. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a good laugh. And I told her my problem, that I was on skid row and I didn't want to be there <laughs> and she gave me a phone said call me if you decide that is not where you want to be and when I called her she said I could come and live with her <laughs> and she had been there for many years and uh, was well known in the community and she introduced me to all of these nice people to my sorority sisters <laughs> and so I was well on the way. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And her name was Mozella Moore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And, and did you start looking for work I, then as well? I, yeah. I found work right away. Mm -hmm. And I uh, worked in, uh, well, I applied for a teaching job. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were no black teachers in Los Angeles at that time. There was one black high school teacher, and uh, I was told that um, I would have to have a California credential, of course. So I went back to Cal State LA, got a credential, mm. and then I was hired as a teacher. But first, before that, I was hired as a clerk with the Los Angeles uh, City Schools um, as a, um, in a classified section. Mm -hmm. And that the classified section included people who didn't have uh, certificates. Mm -hmm. There were janitors and clerks, and so I worked as a clerk in a place where they gave the tests for classified mm -hmm. employees. And that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And went back to school. Well, I met my husband and we got married, and I went back to school and got my credential. Okay. And then I started teaching in elementary school. So can you tell me, uh, I want to ask about your teaching, but can you tell me about meeting your husband? Yes. Um, I, one of my sorority sisters took me to a Methodist church. Mm. And I remember one evening we were having a, um, a meeting with young people, and he walked in, and I said to her, he was such an intelligent-looking man, I said, who is that man? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, girl, he has lots of girlfriends. <laughs> you don't want to get involved with him. But we spoke. And I found out that he had also graduated from Southern. Hmm. And uh, I met, you know, we met, and uh, he, he, uh, he became sort of interested, mm -hmm. but not, it was not a, a, a love at first sight. Mm. No, no, it wasn't that, because we both were mature. Mm. And, but we were friends. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
I remember one time I had to do a presentation at the church and I didn't have a decent dress and I mm. asked him to loan me some money to get a hat and a dress. And he loaned me the money and when I paid him back he said, well I wasn't worried because I knew you didn't want anybody to have anything on you <laughs> and you'd give me the money back. Yeah, And that's the kind of person he was. Right. And uh, I remember one time we had a meeting with the students from USC, mm -hmm. and I made the spaghetti and fixed all the food and uh, said the blessing and mm -hmm. the prayer, and he was impressed. Mm -hmm. And then we started seriously growing in love. Mm -hmm. And we married in 1947. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was uh, he already involved with CORE at that time? Or? Yes, yeah. he was yeah. involved with CORE mm. and had been since 1942. Okay. And he was also involved with another organization called Drew, A.M. Drew. And they were doing, uh, uh, working against segregation in hotels and okay. motels. Do you know what that stands for? Drew. Drew. That was a person's name. Oh, okay. A. M. It, Drew. it was. It was not. It was just an organization. Okay. Organization started by that man. Okay. But he was also working with CORE mm -hmm. at that time, but not very. Uh, it wasn't very much going on. Mm -hmm. But by 1960, by 1958, CORE was really doing a lot. Mm -hmm. We were doing um, stores asking for a fair employment and banks mm. asking for fair employment. At that time in our area where that was predominantly black in Los Angeles around Central Avenue and in, in that area, Central mm -hmm. Los Angeles, mm -hmm. banks, stores, uh, and other businesses did not hire us except as maintenance people, mm -hmm. janitors. Mm -hmm. So we picketed them and negotiated with them to hire young people who needed no more than a high school graduate to do mm -hmm. what they were doing, mm -hmm. you know, to become salespeople and box boys. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we insisted that they <clears throat> trained them for management, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And we were very successful with the grocery stores. Mm. The banks were very reluctant. Mm. But we picketed the banks and negotiated with them. And finally, they hired tellers mm. and started training people for management. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, who were some of CORE's allies? I mean, who, who, I'm sort of interested in what kinds of people worked with you and who CORE worked with. At we time. were integrate, inter, mm -hmm. interracial. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went into, well, in, in 1959, Jess Unruh, who was a, a representative, mm -hmm. passed the bill making uh, accommodations in Los, uh, se segregated accommodations illegal. So we had both blacks and whites in core. And um, mm -hmm. the ACLU, you know, mm -hmm. we, were, we, we were friends with people in the ACLU and lawyers and th that type of people. And we would go out, uh, in our car with suitcases and <laughs> the children mm -hmm. and go to motels and hotels and ask for a room mm. and be denied. Mm -hmm. And then the white couple would come after us and get a room. Mm -hmm. And so we sued those people. We would bring suit against mm -hmm. them. And um, 
there was a young lawyer uh, who did um, uh, cases for us pro bono, mm -hmm. and we had success in suing them, mm -hmm. and they would uh, finally change. Now, of course, I believe that any law that comes about isn't worth much until it has been tested. Mm -hmm. So we set out to test that law and were successful in breaking down. I think we did it more quickly mm -hmm. than it would have happened if we had not mm -hmm. done the test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you what, what drove you, what motivated you? Well, I guess I had I had all, we had always been taught to resist, mm. but we couldn't act overtly. And um, we did that with just acting humbly and standing tall and, and facing these people without being um, subservient, mm. you know, mm -hmm. yet with humility. Mm -hmm. and, and that was instilled in us. Mm -hmm. And so when I had the opportunity to act openly, mm -hmm. came natural. Mm -hmm. Just came natural to, to do this because I knew it was wrong, mm -hmm. what was what, the way that we were treated. And when I could do something to, to uh, prevent it, it was just an, a normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I'm jumping around just a little bit, when you started teaching, what, what year was that that you had your first actual teaching job? In, 55, in 55, 1955. And at that point, how many African Americans were teaching in Los Angeles? There were quite a few. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were quite a few teachers. So things had changed. Things had changed a lot mm -hmm. uh, when I started teaching. Most of the teachers at my school were African Americans, mm -hmm. young, very young teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, all of the children were African Americans, mm -hmm. maybe one or two who were not. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one time a little boy, a white boy, was there and he got into trouble somehow. And he was in the vice principal's office. And the vice principal said to him, you don't have to be here. Hmm. I will send you to any school you want to go. You don't have to be here. He didn't know I was outside listening. Hmm. And this kid, he left. Hmm. He left. I don't know where he went. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But those are the kinds of things. What was that your reaction to that? My when you reaction. Heard that? Yeah. Well, I, I just felt that um, I didn't say anything to him mm -hmm. because he at one time told me <laughs> that if I didn't like it here, I should go to another country <laughs> because <laughs> I was I was very active mm. and I I uh, I would put up black people on the wall for the children with, between Abraham Lincoln and George Washington on President's Day, I would put Frederick Douglass mm. with all his beards and yeah. <laughs> tell the children about that. And uh, I, I, was, I was active. Mm. I was demonstrating then, mm -hmm. and they knew that. And of course, I had I was wearing my hair <laughs> mm. natural. Mm -hmm. Nobody else was mm. except, uh, I guess, uh, the singer, Abby Lincoln, the mm. actress. Yeah. And what was her name? That singer who did folk songs. Yeah. Uh, it'll come to me. Yeah. But we were the only three people that I knew who were doing this, and it was very disturbing to people for us to begin to do that. Mm -hmm. And what did that, what did it symbolize for you? For me? Yeah. Well, I had met, for the first time, I met 
people who had come from Africa, mm -hmm. and we were friends. Mm -hmm. And this woman was so beautiful, and she had her hair short and not pressed, just mm -hmm. what we call nappy hair. Mm -hmm. And I thought how beautiful mm -hmm. that was. Mm -hmm. And I decided I would cut my hair and wear it like that. Mm -hmm. And people wondered why I wanted to do that. They thought, I don't know, hmm. but that's, uh, hmm. yeah. yeah. But I, I did it and my husband was proud. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, and sometimes I would go back and straighten it, and he would say, uh, "I would say, well, people do it, you know, you can make." He said, "But that's not your hair hmm. like that." Mm -hmm. And I and I I took his yeah. uh, his word for mm -hmm. it, and and have done it this mm -hmm. way since nineteen fifties. Wow! Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you were. Putting up, I just love the image of putting up uh, Frederick Douglass on the on the wall, and <laughs> yeah, um, and with George Washington yeah, and Abraham yeah. Lincoln, and clearly, you know, trying to teach, um, put some black role models right, up for the students, right? Yeah, right. And I did that, and I would put out brown paint color for the children to paint themselves, and that was not popular either. Hmm. Mm -hmm because they didn't want to think of themselves as black and beautiful. Mm. But uh, one of the most precious moments for me was one time a little girl came while I was teaching and said to me, she was crying, teacher, he called me black. And I looked at her and said, but you are. You are black and you are beautiful. And a few times, a few days later, somebody called her black and I heard her say, yes, I am, and I'm beautiful because teacher told me so. <laughs> and that was a precious moment, mm -hmm. precious. Mm -hmm. She said it just like, I'm, I'm beautiful because teacher told me so. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would come in and I would walk in and knew they would say, Look at teacher's hair. Look at teacher's hair. Mm -hmm. You know, hunching one another. Right. Looks just like mine. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Made a difference with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you t uh, tell us a little bit about how that led um, to, to your writing? Oh, yes. Yeah. At that time, there were very few books. Mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, that showed us in a positive mm -hmm. image. Right. We had pictures of eating watermelon and mm. red lips and all of right. that, you know, rings in the nose. Mm. And now Du Bois and Langston Hughes had done some books for children, mm -hmm. but there weren't many. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew a publisher in Los Angeles who did my book, Lily of Watts. And I asked him to publish some books for my children, you know. And he said, write them. If you write them, I'll publish them. And I said, no, I am not a writer. And he insisted. And I wrote that book, and he published it. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, reviewed by outstanding reviewers and kind of heady stuff mm -hmm. to be a writer. But I soon learned <laughs> after a couple of times that it wasn't that easy. Mm. And, and I got a lot of rejection slips. Mm -hmm. And then one day I met a young man at Scholastic who had just graduated from Harvard. He was working there, and I had gone in to uh, see a black editor at another place, and she sent me to see him. Mm -hmm. And I went to see him, and um, he took me, that the Harvard uh, 
had just opened up its restaurant, its place for women to go and eat. Mm. And he took me to go there, and that mm. was very nice. Mm. <clears throat> and I told him about a book I wanted to write. And he said, write it. And I wrote a book called The Liquid Trap. And uh, uh, they thought maybe this was about alcohol. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it was about these uh, sinkholes in Louisiana, yeah. sand, sand traps, you yeah. know, where you get caught in, in the sand. And uh, I uh, did that book and he published it and gave it to, showed it to another editor there. And she introduced me to a young editor, Barbara Lalicki. And Barbara was young enough mm -hmm. to take a risk mm -hmm. with, with an African-American writer. Mm -hmm. So she asked me to write a book and I wrote Ty's One Man Band for her. Mm -hmm. And that was the very first book on Reading Rainbow, mm -hmm. Ty's One Man oh, Band. Oh, it was. Oh, uh -huh. Wonderful. Uh -huh. And I stayed with her and wrote most of these books mm -hmm. with Barbara. Were there many African Americans in publishing? Not editors. Not editors. Not right. publishing. Right. No. Right. And I think that that is the problem. Mm. There are no editors mm. uh, who look at our work mm. and can see can understand. Right. Uh, and appreciate where we're coming from. Mm. There, there are some, of course, there are white editors who do, mm. but there are no black editors. Mm. In, in these major publishing houses. Yeah. Not now, many, not yeah. many, not yeah. many. Yeah. And of course now we have less than maybe 1% of all the books mm. that are published, pub written by, by and for black mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe less than 1%. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. right. All children's books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you were able to connect with some people that, that, that understood this, this oh, vision. Oh, yes. Yeah. Barbara, Barbara yeah. appreciated yeah. what I was doing and um, uh, had... Uh, my first book was a book... And my mama, not my first, but My Mama Needs Me was a book about a little boy who... Uh, his mother had a new baby. Mm -hmm. And he was very worried that she didn't love him anymore. Mm -hmm. And he went through that. She went through that with him. And he would go out and people would want him to do things away from home. And he said, I can't. My mama needs me. He has to get back. Yeah. I've read that one to my grandchildren. Oh, really? <laughs> Could you just, just hold it up maybe? Let me see if I can it's find this one, it. This one right here. Yes, yes, it's yes. Over. Yes, this this book uh, was the one. Uh, at first, the illustrator made the characters white, hmm. and my editor showed it to me, and I said, "No way, no way! This right. I could not do that because my purpose." was to have our children mm -hmm. see themselves, and I'm sure that's what most black writers wanted, mm -hmm. for the children to see themselves and their families, mm -hmm. and not only for black children, but for all children to see us mm -hmm. as we are, mm -hmm. you know? And to know who we are mm -hmm. and see us as... Um, now, there was one book early that, um, A Snowy Day by Jack Keats. My daughter's favorite book. Yes, you see? <laughs> and uh, that was very nice. Yeah. One of the first. Yeah. He did that yeah. to show these children as normal mm -hmm. and, and healthy and really uh, 
children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And and all of my books though have uh, a choice, mm -hmm. courage, and change. Every every character has to make choices, mm -hmm. and then they have to stand by the choice if it's a good one, and if they do, they will grow, they mm -hmm. will change, mm -hmm. and everyone has to do that. Even he and <laughs> My mama needs me. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. When you were still teaching, did you ever sort of t field test the books with the, the kids that you were teaching and bring in your stories to them? Uh, no, um, I, I went around the country with mm. books. Mm -hmm. I wasn't teaching then. Okay, I, so. I, I, I was writing okay. and consulting. Okay. And, but I would go to schools across the nation. Mm -hmm. and and talk to children and read my books mm -hmm. and got wonderful letters from children thanking me mm -hmm. and telling me uh, how much they enjoyed knowing uh, the characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was quite a pleasant experience to, mm -hmm. do, to do the books. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And we won some... Uh, Interesting prizes, Coretta Scott King Award for Justin in the Best Biscuits, and this one won the Coretta Scott King Award um, for the the best book, and. This one won the Christopher, the Catholic Christopher Award, Mississippi. No, not this one. This one won um, the uh, Jane Addams, mm. Jane Addams Notable Book. Right, right. And this one, Coretta Scott King, uh, Mississippi Challenge Notable mm -hmm. Book, and the Christopher Best Book Award. Mm -hmm. uh, that's Can you talk a little bit about that book, which maybe book, has a little bit of a, you know, targeted maybe a little bit older audience? Yes, or, this yeah. is for young adults. Yeah. yeah. And this also is for young adults. Yeah. This one is about the slavery doing the Revolutionary War mm. and uh, Elizabeth Freeman winning her freedom in, mm. Miss, in Massachusetts through the Massachusetts Constitution. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this one is for young adults about the 1964 mm. and 68 Mississippi challenge mm -hmm. and all about Mississippi and how the people in Mississippi had struggled mm -hmm. since the beginning of time mm -hmm. uh, to free themselves. And finally, in 1964, they went to the Democratic National Convention and Fannie Lou Hamer mm -hmm. <laughs> with President Johnson mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of them and she had an opportunity to say to them, we didn't come here to just say, do nothing. Mm -hmm. We came to take our seat. Mm -hmm. And President Johnson promised that they would have a time and they went back and did all of that legal work to uh, make possible the seating of, of mm -hmm. their delegate. And of course, I wrote a piece about that for the Big Book of Peace, mm -hmm. which said there can be no peace without justice. Mm -hmm. And how they went to Washington and stood waiting for the Congress to decide whether they would seat them or the white delegation. They lost the, right. that, but they won. Mm -hmm. They won in spite of the fact mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. were not seated. And then they came back and did the work that made it possible for the, the Voting Rights Act to be passed, mm -hmm. and we're really concerned mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. that that 
the right to vote is in danger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. What, what kind of work do you hope that your writing does? Well, I hope that it tells children, black and white, all children, that they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And all of my books point that out, mm -hmm. that you, you do what you feel is right. For instance, this book, Alex Primer, mm -hmm. this young boy was forced to read by a white girl in Virginia. And she told him he could go up to Connecticut. I think it was Connecticut. And he would be free. But he knew better. And his mother told him that he must not read because he was a slave. Hmm. And he could be sold into, away from her. But she insisted, and this girl made him read. And one day, he got very interested in reading, and one day the grandmother caught him reading, and she tried to take the book away from him. It was a primer. He wouldn't give it up, mm -hmm. and she hit him in the face with her riding crop. He still wouldn't give mm. it up. And his children have that primer oh. in uh, Connecticut. Hmm. So and these are the kinds of things that I t try to show children, not tell them, hmm. but show them that you make choices mm -hmm. and, the, and you must, if it is a good choice, and a good choice is what is good for all living things, not just for you, mm -hmm. but for all living things. When you know that is a good choice, then you have courage. Mm -hmm. And courage will help you to stick with that thing. And you will change. You will grow. And all of my characters show that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Mm. That courage will give us that kind of stick to itiveness to let us do what is right. Mm -hmm. And that is why I was able to do mm -hmm. the kinds of things that I did, like march beside Nazis and go to jail, take that risk. Because mm -hmm. that's what making the choice is. Mm -hmm. Choosing is a risk. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound preachy. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> But it is. That's what, that's what choosing is. It's mm -hmm. taking risks. Mm -hmm. And when you risk, if you have the courage, because courage is that kind of thing that comes from being able to listen, listen to your heart. Mm -hmm. And not, not that romantic thing. Mm -hmm. It's that inner spirit that guides you to do what is right. Mm -hmm. And you will learn how to go forward or step back mm -hmm. at the right moment. Mm -hmm. And when you learn that, then you can grow. Mm -hmm. You will grow, you will change. And as uh, Lillian Smith used to say, you won't have status, you'll have statue. <laughs> So we've talked about your childhood and then and your work in Los Angeles Angeles. and with mm -hmm. CORE and teaching in the books and mm -hmm. how do you see all these things connected? Well, um, I, I, um, I did um, book reviews for the Los Angeles Times mm -hmm. when Johnson made available for them to bring out more material for multicultural mm -hmm. understanding. And so I read all of those old books that mm -hmm. came back from Du Bois and uh, 
from, mm. uh, and I was able to do, uh, um, oh, names are there and can't come. Mm. The, the, uh, the guy who was in prison in South Africa, who Mandela, Mandela, Mandela. Yeah. Uh, Mandela's book. Mm -hmm. I will still be moved. Mm. And I, I reviewed that book for the Los Angeles Times and all of Du Bois's books and uh, James Baldwin's mm. book. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I didn't review James Baldwin's book. James Baldwin came to speak for us at CORE mm. and he had just uh, written um, that book that was... Um, Oh, uh, go tell it on the mountain. No, 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 not that one. It was the one that talked about uh, Malcolm X and mm. oh, I know the book. Mm. But anyway, he had just written that book, mm. and the editor at, at Los Angeles reviewed it, and I rebutted his mm. his uh, for core. Right. And I rebutted his review, and he had said that Baldwin was a bigot hmm. in writing this book. What is that book? <laughs> but anyway, he, um, I proved from Baldwin's words yeah. that he was not, because if he's, he, he, uh, I disagree with some things with Baldwin, but not. I knew he was not a bigot mm. because at the end of his book he said, if we, the few that we are, can bring about a peace, we can save this nation. Mm. We can work to save this nation and give it justice. And, and after I did that rebuttal, he printed it and he asked me to Review books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Great. And reviewing books, I I decided I, that's not for me. I need to write. Mm. I need to write books, not mm -hmm. just talk about and criticize other people's work. Mm -hmm. Let me try to do something too. Mm -hmm. mm. So, but I will tell you some exciting moments. Mm in my life mm -hmm. that I feel. Okay, let's hold on for just... Okay, we're back. Okay. I marched uh, in housing tracks in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and we, uh, they were building houses in areas near where a lot of black people lived, and they wouldn't sell them to us. Right. Right. They wouldn't sell us those houses. So we picket the picket them mm -hmm. and I can remember one Saturday we were picketing at a place in what is now Carson, mm -hmm. California mm -hmm. and everything was going well. We had a big line, a good line and there was a, a Jewish person, Herbert, who had been in a concentration camp in Germany. Mm -hmm. And he was marching with us. Mm. He had been very active in CORE. He went on the Freedom Rides. Mm. And oh, soon the police came. And they came and stood across the street watching us. And of course, they always brought tension. Mm. But after a while, the tension eased with the police. And then about four cars drove up full of white men dressed like Nazis. They had on Nazi uniform, including the swastika. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, on their signs, their sticks were so big that they could have damaged us mm. with their placards. And their placards read, Ovens too good for niggas. Niggas, go back to the trees, you monkeys. Go back to the trees. And I saw Herbert, 
and I was so, I got worried about him. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if these people would make us lose our stance and become violent. Mm -hmm. But we had been trained, and finally I saw Herbert leave the line in a staggering uh, way. And I wondered, you know, uh, I was very uh, outraged, and, but, and I wondered if I shouldn't leave too. But I stayed and I was questioning myself. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Why do I want people thinking that I want to live beside white people? Mm. Why am I here? And I, somebody started singing, Oh Freedom, this lone voice, Oh Freedom Over Me. Mm -hmm. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. And I thought, well, I'm not here because I want to live beside white people. I'm here because I want us to be able to decide where it is we want to live, and we can have the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. And I lost my anger, hmm. and I felt pleased with myself that I had stayed, mm -hmm. and um, I was there with not self-assertiveness, mm. but there and was at peace, mm -hmm. and was there a long time after the Noxes had gone home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another time, I mm -hmm. had been asked to go with a group of artists and writers and sculptors to Nigeria, mm -hmm. to the African Festival of Culture, where all uh, people from the diaspora mm -hmm. were coming. And I was the only children's book writer, mm -hmm. so I was able to make a presentation. And they were quite uh, pleased that I had come because they felt that they needed more children's books oh, in, yeah. on the continent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I stayed after Nigeria, I went to Ghana and to other places, Cameroon mm. and to Ghana, and looked around and uh, and I I felt in many instances in, in Ghana especially they mm. looked at me and they wanted to know who is that woman. Mm. These were some women in the market mm. where I was and. Somebody said, she's a Kikui. She's a Kikui woman. They said, no, I don't think she's Kikui. She might be a Chola. <laughs> and and a, at that time, I spoke to another lady who was not with them. And when they heard my voice, they said, oh, my God, she's a white woman. <laughs> oh. So you can imagine how I felt. Mm. And, and it's amazing. I don't like to think of that. But I can remember one time when I was a teenager. I was a freshman in college and walking down the street in Louisiana. And soldiers were out there, were there. And a white soldier called to his friends and in the drugstore and said, hey, come see this pretty nigger. And for some reason, I got that same feeling mm. there. And I don't know why, mm. but when they said, oh my God, she's a white woman. She's a, not one of us. Mm. 
And that's what they were implying. Mm -hmm. She's not one of us. Hmm. So I went, I knew a, a great poet there, Kofi Owuna. And he was gracious to take me to Elmina, that castle. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to that, and I listened to the people, this young man, talk about the people who had been in there. Yeah. And he was like a, a person who had no, he had, his voice was like, People doing an ad on TV, mm. you know, and there's no uh, way of connecting. And at that time, uh, I wa we walked up on the deck to see uh, the guns mm. that, and, and the door of no return. Mm -hmm. And when we walked up there, and here were these men in chains. And at first I thought, my God, I'm hallucinating something. It was a prison wow. at that time. Wow. It was a prison. But we, so many of us have gone there. They have, I understand that is now no longer mm. so. Mm -hmm. So Kofi and I went and stood on the, he wanted me to see the, those big guns that were trained on the ships mm -hmm. when they, so that when the slaves were about to leave, there could be no interference. Mm -hmm. And we went in, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean and walked on the beach, and I was looking up at those um, guns and listening to the sound of the ocean rolling mm -hmm. up. And ocean waves always remind me of the blues for mm -hmm. some reason. Mm -hmm. And I stood there and I looked up at those guns and I thought, I am not African and I, I am not American. I, we had not been allowed to carry the flag at, mm -hmm. the, at the festival. And I am not protected under the flag of my country. And I broke down and cried. Mm. And Kofi said, what is it with you Americans? Every one of you who come here, you do that. And I couldn't tell him why. Mm. But I knew that uh, I'm not African, really, and I'm not American, but I have a heritage of Africa, and I'm born in America, mm -hmm. so I can take the best of both mm -hmm. cultures mm -hmm. and be who I am mm -hmm. and become whole. I do not. I, I am not uh, three-fifths of a person. And I thought that there. I'm not three-fifths of a person, as the Constitution said. Mm -hmm. On the shores of Africa, I felt this. Mm -hmm. I am not a potential. I am. And my blackness is not a lack. It is. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I, I am unique. Mm -hmm. Unique neither one or the other. And I can understand why Africa does not really know us. It was too painful. Mm -hmm. We were brutally taken away, mm -hmm. never heard of again. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever returned. Mm. And the pain is so great. You have to suppress that pain and forget, mm -hmm. forget. And now we're going back and they are beginning to see. We are very much a part of them, mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. And of course I came back thinking uh, I'm unique, but when I came back, I couldn't talk about that to anybody. Mm -hmm. They might think I'm being arrogant and mm -hmm. not wanting to identify with my African heritage. 
And so I didn't say, I didn't talk about it. But I figured not knowing, and I didn't know enough about Africa. Three months in Africa tells you nothing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know enough. But what I could do, I could begin to find out more mm -hmm. about my heritage and about my people, who, where they had come from. Yeah. And I did. Yeah. My grandmother came from Guinea, mm -hmm. and she was part of the French and ended up in Haiti. And from Haiti, after the French, the Toussaint L'Overture mm -hmm. revolution ended up in Louisiana. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I can find out more and become fully whole. Mm -hmm. And I think I've done that. Mm -hmm. I have looked at African religions, looked at Christian religion mm -hmm. and philosophies and all of that, and I think I can see comparisons mm -hmm. between Jesus and my people. Mm -hmm. And that is why we were able to turn the other cheek and walk the second mile. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And I feel that. Um, if we can finally really have a discourse about race in this country as the South Africans did mm -hmm. for reconciliation, mm -hmm. we will become healed. Mm -hmm. It will be a healing. The mm -hmm. Kerner Commission recognized that, mm -hmm. that we need it to really look at the problem of racism, discuss it, mm -hmm. but the Kerner Commission was denied, mm -hmm. and we fell back into the old ways mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. doing things. And until we can make that reconciliation, we will not be healed. What do you think it's going to take? It's going to take acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. We as the mm -hmm. people who were oppressed and those people who are the relatives and the generations of the oppressors, mm -hmm. we are going to have to sit down together and really discuss this and acknowledge, acknowledge the pain because I'm sure that there is pain on both sides. Yeah. You cannot murder, you cannot mistreat, you cannot oppress and not feel guilt. Mm -hmm. And guilt is very damaging, mm -hmm. very damaging. And you cannot be treated that way without feeling anger. Mm -hmm. And anger is very damaging. Mm -hmm. And we, can, we must come together and discuss this, this, the fear that they feel. There's so much fear of us, mm -hmm. and we sense that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's fear. There's guilt, and there's anger, and there is humility, and wanting, and longing on both sides. I have gone to films, and, and I have seen people who have, who are the relatives of those who were oppressors, mm -hmm. mention that when they, they know their relatives, when they find out that their relatives were doing this, they couldn't walk out of their house for days. Mm -hmm. They were so depressed. And they couldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. You see? 
Yeah. There's nobody who would understand, nobody who's willing to listen. And we, we're going to have to, I think, come to this reconciliation mm -hmm. if we are to become whole mm -hmm. and, and not be so afraid that we have to wage wars, mm -hmm. have soldiers everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. set up a procedure for right. doing it and an expectation and, mm -hmm. and acknowledgement that it's, a, it's painful for all the parties. Mm -hmm. That's right. They did it in South Africa. They did it in Australia. Mm -hmm. But we cannot do it. When we tried it, they tried it in Greensboro, North Carolina. I don't know if you followed that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so there have been attempts. Been attempts. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. just hope we can. And mm. of course, I traveled and went to the Soviet Union on mm -hmm. a peace march. That's right, yeah, yeah. And um, what was that? while that? we were there, every town that we went into, we walked from uh, one place to Moscow and uh, uh, Every place we, new place we went into, they'd bring out this huge round loaf of bread and salt. Hmm. And each person would break bread. Hmm. And as we broke bread and ate, shared that bread, we broke barriers. Hmm. And while I was there, I began to understand why we were not allowed to eat in restaurants and would sit with families to eat. It breaks barriers. Mm -hmm. Breaking bread breaks barriers. And there we broke the barriers and we did not remain strangers or the other. Mm -hmm. We were able to really discuss and meet mm -hmm. and, and get along. This very basic, very ancient level, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we talked about the need for peace and to do away with uh, hmm. uh, atomic bombs, nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. Mm -hmm. And I, while I was there, I was given the um, Coretta Scott King Award for this book. And uh, I sent a letter hmm. for acceptance, and my editor read it. And that letter said, I, I had to make a choice. Would I go on this walk or would I stay and go to San Francisco and receive that mm -hmm. honorable award? And then I thought about the Coretta Scott King Award and what the children would think. Mm -hmm. And I thought they would appreciate it if I walked for peace. Mm rather than go. And I made the choice mm -hmm. to walk for peace mm -hmm. rather than come to the acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can end with this question then connecting to that, you know, the, uh, your work in the, in the movement and then we talked about reconciliation and, and peace. How mm -hmm. do you you know, connect all of, all of these pieces? Well, I do feel <clears throat> that there can be no peace without justice. Mm -hmm. And all of the efforts that we made in the 60s especially, and throughout our history, mm -hmm. we didn't just start uh, working for freedom uh, in the 60s. And it was just not Martin Luther King and, and uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and mm -hmm. Rosa Parks. It was a lot of young, energetic people and leaders and who were killed and who were mm -hmm. uh, maimed and, and um, bombed and, mm -hmm. you know. So I do feel that these people who can do this and really change are those who can listen 
really know how to listen. Mm -hmm. And listen not thinking about what they are going to say against the person who is talking, mm -hmm. but listen and come to an understanding mm -hmm. that we are all, we are all one, mm -hmm. one, and that we must work together to bring peace, peace to our, to our own lives, to the lives of others, mm -hmm. to this nation, mm -hmm. to the world. And when we really know this, when we know it, mm -hmm. we will do it. Mm -hmm. We will do it when we know it. And, and all the great thinkers have said that. Mm -hmm. When you know a thing, you will do it. Mm -hmm. Howard Thurman was one of those. Mm -hmm. Stress that. Mm -hmm. Know it and do it. Mm -hmm. And I feel that is what has kept me with the faith mm -hmm. to try to bring about a message that fits our time. Mm -hmm. All down the history, Gospels have changed to fit the time and the need of the people. Mm -hmm. And we need that now. It's ongoing. It's ongoing work. It's yeah. on. Christianity is an ongoing. It's mm -hmm. ongoing. Mm -hmm. It is not steady. It is not to be uh, accepted or rejected. Mm -hmm. It is to be carried on mm -hmm. to bring about and serve the needs of our time. Mm -hmm. And I think that... Uh, I wish I would, was 20 years younger, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, and I feel that my time is yeah. not there. Well, can I ask how old you are today? I'm 90 years old to mm -hmm. this past uh, September. Yeah. 90 September, October, November, December, January, February, Yeah. and six months. <laughs> 90 years old and six months. Yeah. So you can see I, I don't have too much, mm. all things being equal, <laughs> all things being equal. Yeah, mm. but more books. <laughs> yeah, a few more books, right. I was going to say, yeah. mo but moving and fighting and, yeah. 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 I, I wish I could get a memoir published, mm. but that's, mm. it's hard now. Mm. Mm -hmm. They want stuff from celebrities. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you've done so, so much, and I, we're so grateful for sharing the story with us today. Well, I am so grateful for you to listen to my story. I am. I feel blessed, and I feel honored. Yeah. As do we, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any last thing you'd like to say before we wrap up? So it's just beautiful um, what you're saying. I, I would just like to acknowledge my children. Mm. I have two sons. I had, I had a son to pass away in 2008. Mm. He had worked very hard in the uh, Black Studies mm. department at Cal State LA. Mm -hmm. And he um, had done some books for young men and... Um, I have, my, my uh, younger son is living in uh, uh, Santa Monica, mm -hmm. California, and he works for the uh, City College mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, he did films mm -hmm. then, uh, uh, but I am very proud of my children mm -hmm. and my grandson, whose children you saw, mm -hmm. uh, has been very reliable mm -hmm. and he takes good care mm -hmm. and see to it that I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this why you came back to California that, to be close that's to family? Why, yeah. That's why I came yeah. back and he invited me along with his wife who you met, yeah. he met and uh, and his children. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So that I feel blessed. Mm -hmm. Lots of friends mm -hmm. and uh, acquaintances. Oh, that was one thing I didn't talk mm -hmm. about. In 1970, I worked with a group of peoples of color nurses. Oh, right. And we started that name, people of color, rather than minorities. Mm -hmm. We did work in the schools of nurses. At the time when we were doing this work to bring culture, we, we uh, wanted to get them to know and appreciate the cultures of people of color, right. which would be helpful in making diagnosis. Yep. Um, at that time, when they diagnosed shock, uh, cyanosis, and inflammation, they used red, white, and blue. And a lot of us died hmm. in shock because we could not turn white, we could not turn red, mm -hmm. we could not turn blue. And so we worked on that mm. and, and these nurses mm -hmm. gave yeah. indications of how to determine that. And we also, when at that time, you could go to visit your pe people in the hospital between two and four. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't go because we were working. Right. And, and then they had one set of, one menu, mm -hmm. and a lot of the food that they gave, we didn't like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and didn't, people of, of, of color yep. didn't eat that kind of food. And uh, there was another thing that we did, too. We um, had it so that during transition, at one time, you couldn't, you, you couldn't bring children for the end of that period. Mm. Now, the whole family, we mm -hmm. talked about how necessary that was for peoples of color. Mm -hmm. And now, anybody, all, everybody, when doing transition, they provide a room where you can go and be with that patient mm -hmm. during that period. Asian people were suffering from dehydration because at one time they would just put ice water on the table mm -hmm. and expect people to drink the ice water. They didn't drink ice water. Mm. There were so few nurses of Native American Mm -hmm. We couldn't get a statistic. Hmm. And uh, so now, because of this, we added all of this into the textbooks mm -hmm. for nurses and changed, made all those changes. And now um, we are very pleased that the term peoples of color mm -hmm. is uh, much more. In Common usage. Common yeah. uses yeah. than yeah. minorities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? So I, w I did the culture of African Americans. Mm -hmm. I did the, the, the African American culture part. Part of that. For, consulted with the nurses. Yeah. And, and uh, did that part. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that was in 1970. That was yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. Mm hmm. The Western. Uh, Interstate Commission on Higher Education sponsored that project, right. yeah. and Dr. Marie Branch was the major nurse who mm. did, who headed this mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad. Oh, yeah, I yeah. am too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very. Very, very important. important. Very important. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that was where the term came from. Yeah, I didn't. No. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that was the, we, we uh, thought minority is, yeah. is insulting. Yeah. You are minority less. Right. Peoples right. of color define us yeah. accurately. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Asians, 
African Americans, mm -hmm. Chinese, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. We all work together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on that project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, let me just thank you one more time. Oh, and this yeah. was just uh, such well, a treat for us and such, a, such an honor. So, well, you. I put out strawberries and grapes and cookies. <laughs> well, we will <laughs> take Help advantage yourself. of your hospitality. Help thank yeah. you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.